Go into the music. It's been tomorrow. Will be three months since the self-titled album released, and uh, I listened to it in its entirety again today and tonight twice. Uh, today alone, and uh, I absolutely love it. Um, it's uh, it's outstanding. What what was the process like? Because I know this is your third record. What was the process like? Uh, basically, just creating the self-titled record, Roses on Red. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we've been, Allison and I, um, for the most part, she started the band, right. and, um, and then I got, I got and joined in, um, shortly thereafter. Okay. But, uh, you know, ever since, uh, after the first two CDs, you know, we, and, and they're good in their own respect, and, and we love the songs, and, and that's a big part of our history, we had a, a great time making those albums, but, you know, we really, really wanted to show how we've grown musically and um and matured as individuals so um i guess this uh last album has been about two years in the making um it's pretty much as soon as until we meet again came out which is our second album that came out in 2011 mm -hmm. around uh october or november um then we pretty much started writing almost uh while the album was getting pressed, actually, we started uh, working on ideas for this third album. And um, at the time, we were a four-piece. I was the only guitar player. And um, last year, in, around November, we recruited Blake, who ended up becoming our second guitar player. And um, we probably had about five to seven songs written at the time. And pretty much Blake's audition was... Um, he, I knew he wrote his own music, and I knew he was a great musician. He, he was a drummer and guitarist, and he was a really good singer, too, so I knew he had the talent. Him and I had been friends online for a long time. I had him come to the house and jam, and I was pretty much like, hey, I'm, I'm going to play you these songs that I've written, and I just want you to, you know, work with me on what you think is, is going to make them sound better. And it was almost instantaneous. We ran through three or four of the songs, and he, um, he, you know, put parts to them that complemented that what was already written extremely well. And then it was just kind of like a, you know, he was pretty much in the band uh, from then on out. Everybody just loved having him. I can I can remember saying that after he grabbed a like guitar uh, guitar soulmate or something, and yeah. I mean it was it was it was awesome. But going back to what he was saying about we had a few songs written before. Like, right when we uh, released Until We Meet Again, I know Burnout, we wrote it right when Until We Meet Again got released, and we were thinking, gosh, why didn't we put this on that CD? You know, we had written it like a month after, but to me, I think it turned out for the best that we put it on this new CD because it fits so well with the other song, so kind of glad that we, we wrote it a month later, even though we you know, kind of beat ourselves up about it. You know, when we had, when we just released it. But. So when, you know, last year when Blake got in the band, um, um, been a little over a year today, but uh, he, he already had a good deal of, of songs written, and he brought those to us. And Allison changed the lyrics and put her lyrics to them and, and changed the melodies up, and then I added, um, you know, my guitar parts, and then Caveman, our drummer, kind of helped arrange them a little bit more, and he, he changed the drum beats up. And um, we really, you know, Roses unreaded them up. And um, so half the song, half the album was, was originally written uh, between Allison and myself and then Blake, and then we all came together and took all the songs that were uh, fragments um, and then just made them even better as a group. And um, and then there was a there was a I know Blind Lead the Blind, which is our first single off the CD, and it's, it's still a current single. It's our latest music video. Uh, that was the first song that Blake and I wrote from start to finish together. Um, where I had the opening riff and brought it to him, and I said, "All right, we're going to sit down and we're not leaving this room until we have a complete song." And that was including me too. I had my car down that night as well. So uh, Allison and Blake and myself wrote. Blind Lead the Blind from start to finish in probably about three or four hours, and yeah. um, it ended up being uh, a really, really catchy song, and that, uh, when we went to the studio, our, our producer, Dave Cal, said, that's got to be the first single, that's got it, that's it right there. So, that's pretty much in, a, in, a, in five minutes how, how uh, two, I guess, two years worth of writing and arranging in five minutes.
Wow. That's how the third album came about. Nice. Yeah, I mean, and like I said earlier, it's it, it it's really it's outstanding. I, I absolutely love it. And uh, killer album. And uh, I guess the, my, the question I've got now is, uh, like you said, this is the first record to feature Blake on the album. He came in shortly before uh, before the record, and you wrote it with him. What? At what point do we get to where, hey, let's bring in a second guitar player? And what led you to seek him out and um, extend to uh, the dual guitar threat? Was it just for more yeah. power and more a stronger sound, or uh, was there other reasons? Well, I'm um, I'm not. You, you generally, in my experience, you, you generally find two. Uh, there, there's two types of guitar players. There's guitar players who play play better with somebody else and then there's guitar players who really can't play at all with anybody else. Mm. and i'm definitely the uh the former I, I play much much better as as a in a group and i play better um with somebody who is playing parts that complement my um i'm definitely not a solo solo power dude at all uh, but the first two albums my good friend justin rublitis uh, he joined the band uh, about a month after I did, and he was on those first two albums, and, and, and I mean, right after um, Until We Meet Again came out, he had just gotten married and just had a little girl, and I think his little girl was a month old, and he, he came to us, and he was like, you know, guys, you guys are um, you know, are practicing a whole lot, and I live, I live you know, a lot farther out than everybody else, and you guys are really wanting to go full time with it, and I've got this. Uh, you know, I've got a family, and I'm working fifty, sixty hours a week, and I just, I, I, you know, he's like, I just can't do it anymore. So he uh, he left the band right after the second album came out, and uh, he's still, um, you know, to this day, he's still part of the uh, Roses and Red family. Man, we go to his house, and uh, you know, we all stay in good contact, and it was a, the most amicable, uh, I guess band breakup or um m member leaving a band as it member could be change, yeah. yeah member change so Good. we shot we out a couple of guys and like you said the couple of guys that we brought out to try out after justin left um they were more of the solo type guitar player where they just couldn't um i was like here here's what you know i need you to do for the songs that were already written and they were wanting to you know do something that we didn't really think fit what we were trying to do so everybody came to me and said hey man you wrote these songs you know the songs um why don't we just you know you be the only guitar player until we find somebody else mm -hmm. and then for about a year you know we were a four piece i was the only guitarist which was by far one of the hardest things i've ever done in my life i really really had to set my game up mm -hmm. and um we, we we didn't settle for a, for a second guitar player at all. You know, we we had people approach us that wanted the gig, but um, it wasn't until Blake came over and we found Blake, and uh, that's that's when we really decided yeah. that he was the best fit. We actually knew Blake from he played drums before he played guitar, and he was a really good drummer as well. So that's how we kind of knew him. And then he was like, you know, I switched over to guitar. I really want to play guitar in a band. And like, you know, come on out. You have to be. We were doing auditions, and it just fit perfectly. Like I said, they were just meant to be. It was, it was awesome. And it works real. It works so well. I think. Um, just yeah. yeah, it's I and I th I think that when you bring in a second guitar player, when you got two, there's so many other doors that open up creatively and musically that you can do so many more things if there's if there's two. Yeah, and um, what I like about it is, uh, you know, there's a lot of bands that have two guitar players, and and not saying anything bad about people that do this, but a, a lot of the time you see the two guitar players will play pretty much the exact same part um, for about half the song, and then maybe during the, maybe in the verses or in the choruses, they're playing something different. Well, for the most part, nine times out of ten, Blake and I play completely different parts, and we do a lot of switching up as well. Um, it takes Set You Free, for an example. Um, I, in the clean verses, I do the rhythm, and then in the choruses, I play lead, and then um, in the bridge with uh, he does the solo and then I play rhythm. But we do a whole lot of going back and forth and switching up. There's no 
you're playing lead here, you know, in this song. There's none of that. It's just um, when we get together and, and write the song, whatever, you know, whatever works best that he's singing, he's usually the one playing the rhythm part. And, um, and you know, it just, it's, it's, there's no ego involved. It's really cool. And, and um, to me, it's like how yeah. said a salt and pepper and <laughs> yin and yang because as I look at it, uh, John brings like the, the riffage and the heaviness, but Blake brings the melody with it. And, um, it just, and it goes together so well because you know, I'm just a sucker for both things. And then I mean, you add them together and it just makes something crazy awesome. And I mean, to me, they're like each other's salt and pepper, yin and yang, whatever, you know, those kind of analogies. But, but yeah, I think they really work together well. Yeah, I mean, it, it does reflect in the music. I mean, I think that if it didn't work together well, it would reflect in the music, and tr it, you'd be able to tell immediately if it wasn't working very well. I think. Um, and if yeah. you, it definitely makes me a more mature writer when they, when they work together. I mean, uh, not that not that I wasn't to begin with, but this this third one really brought something new out of me. I think it's because because of both of them working together. Right, and it's just interesting that you bring up your songwriting because I was going to ask you about that. But lyrically, um, the lyrics on this record are um, very mature songwriting, very mature lyrically. I think, and very in the same way, it's, it's a lot of lyrics. I think are dark but hopeful at the same time. It's like dark, but it's like it gets better. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, that's exactly what I try to go for. Too, like when I start writing something, it's more on a dark level. And at the end, I try to bring hope and light to it, whatever darkness it was. And I got, and I was like, I'm beginning to see a pattern in my writing. Like, I start off, and I'm always, you know, like on this, uh, your own edge, or your, you know, something, something bad has happened. And at the end, it clears up, it clears itself up like some kind of way. And that's what I kind of go for. Because, I mean, that's what we all want when we're on the dark side. We want to see the light. And I, that's what I want with my music. So, I mean, and, and the other two albums, I think lyrically, I wrote a lot of those poems and songs when I was younger. But with this album, I wrote them at the age I am right now. Mm. That's probably why they're more mature as well. Yeah. Do, do you find that it's um, that when you're writing the songs that are that are dark, and then at the end of the song, it's there's that message of hope that it's, it's therapeutic for you while you're writing it. Sometimes that right. um, maybe you're going through something when you're writing it. You're obviously with a lot of songs you're going through what you're writing about, and then as you as you're writing the song and writing lyrics, that hopeful message comes through at the end, and it kind of helps you out a little bit too as a songwriter. Is that something right. that happens a lot with you? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, like I said, I think it's, a, for me, well, I've been writing lately, I've, I've actually wrote about 30 things in the last month, and I'm like, where is this coming from? And every time I read one, I'm like, there's this pattern, it's like, you know, it starts off, it's dark, it's, you know, it's gritty, and then it comes out, and it's like, there's hope. And I said, I guess that's like what I've been uh, kind of going for this time. Um, so I also said he wanted to write a song, something about Trace of the Darkness, and it seems like everything I've been writing has like some kind of way to that place of the darkness and I, and I kind of like that I, I, I guess he got kind of got in my head in a way but that's where it's been going lately my inspiration hmm. yeah the, the songs that really stick out to me especially you know the for me when I listen to a CD just different songs have something that sticks out to me every time but, and it's always something different every time Deja Vu and Burnout are the two that really stuck out to me the last time I listened to the album lyrically especially is very very deep and not that the rest of the album isn't but those two songs specifically are very I think very deep and very um, complex lyrical songs and as well as instrumentally complex as well and um what was there any specific message that you were hoping to get through with the Roses and Red record, the self-titled one this time around? Um, and what were, were you really going for um, thematically with it, if anything? A lot of the songs were about kind of you know cutting the ties with people, and sometimes I go with that name. To me, with that name, sums sums it up a lot. And that's why I put that in the, the very end of the CD because. A lot of these songs, I didn't cut ties with people. And at, the, and at, the, at the time, I didn't think it was going to work out. You know, I'd never be close to this person anymore. Or I'd never see them again. And um, I was in a dark place because I had to let some people go out of my life. But in the end, it all worked out, you know, and we're all good again. I mean, just various relationships. 
not just one in particular, but a lot of things happened in the process of me writing, you know, this album in the last two years. And um, I think uh, I think a lot of that reflected that I just cut in ties with people and, you know, not wanting these relationships to be over, but you couldn't sever them at the time. You, could, you, you, know, you just couldn't, you couldn't repair them at the time. And, but now that it's all said and done, you know, everything's okay. But at the time, you know, I didn't think it was. And that was my way of letting it all out, I guess you could say. Awesome. Not, not saying the uh, not saying the people um, that the ties were cut with were bad people. Right. Maybe um, the you have to have you have to cut somebody out of your life for the better um, of yourself and the better of them. Even though but you might, time, but not yeah. necessarily forever. Just in that time, and maybe it's better for you. Yeah, maybe it's be- that's what's best for both for of you. Not necessarily yeah. that you're, you're a bad person or they're a bad person. Maybe at that particular point in each other's lives, uh, it's as if you two don't, um, you know, you two just walk your separate directions, mm-hmm. and then when you're in a better place, you can you can come back and um, and and have that relationship again. That's exactly right. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's something that a lot of people don't think about in their everyday lives as well. Sometimes is when people think of cutting ties or you know going in a separate direction with somebody, they immediately you know your mind goes to thinking, oh, they must be a bad person or you know something's wrong. But sometimes you know, like you said, um, there are times that. Um, it is just best for both people. Maybe something's going on with one person that's, you know, affecting somebody else so badly that they just have to take a step back. And I uh, think that maybe that's something people don't realize in their everyday lives that maybe needs to be done sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just like that cliche saying, you know, if you love something, set it free, if it comes back, you know, it's meant to be. But, you know, even that's with any, anything, you know, um, and love and friendship, it works, anything like that, you know, just, you know, sometimes you just got to step back and, mm-hmm. and just, and just work it out, even though it hurts you. Yeah. And you just gotta, I mean, it's cool to say that sounds, but it's true, it's, it's really true, and I think a lot of that was probably going through my head at the time, and that's, you know, if you listen to it, you really listen deep, you can probably hear that in a lot of those lyrics. Yeah, absolutely, and like I said earlier, it, lyrically, inst- all together, all around, it's uh, probably one of my, honestly, one of my favorite albums that I've heard this year, and I've, I've heard a lot of records, but it, it's definitely up there, just because it's so, it's so honest, and you, you don't hear a lot of completely honest records and albums anymore, you know? And I think that that's one reason that, personally, I like it so much, and a lot of people have taken to it so well, is it's so honest and open. You know, you don't hold anything back. You know, it's just, you put it all on the table, and if you like it, great. If you don't, you put right. you put it out there. And uh, that's what makes an album good, in my opinion. Well, there's so much, it's, it's so easy to, to go to Nashville or, or L.A., um, and just sell your soul, um, you're, you're, you know, and just say, make a musician out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a pretty face and I've got a, a, an awesome body and I can, I can play, you know, five or six chords on the guitar. Um, it, it's so easy to sell your soul and to, for somebody to put a, a lyric sheet in front of you and say, you're going to sing this song. And that's how, that's how, you know, I grew up listening to country music. Um, don't hate me for it, but you know, like Garth Brooks and, um, and, and Randy Travis and even like George Jones and Merle Haggard, I grew up listening to that stuff. And to me, that was, those guys were honest. But nowadays you've got all these, uh, these Nashville stars coming out of that area and, um, you know, doing that sort of music and the music's all, you know, pre-recorded. Um, you know, they bring in session players to play the music, um, you know, they have somebody else write the music before they do that, and then by the time it gets to the uh, the front man, it's it's all written down for them, and all they have to do is carry a tune and and sing in a microphone. And you know, I'm not knocking anybody who is uh, doing what they love doing and is successful doing it. I, I can't. I mean, if you can make a living playing music and that's really what you love doing, then I mean, my gosh, more power to you. But. Um, I just feel like uh, music as a whole has lost all its honesty, and the people that are on stage and on uh, on TV and on the radio singing, 
these songs and um, whether it's country pop or just pop music in general, it's uh, it's none of it's honest. It's all you know they're singing about something that they didn't write. Yeah. And uh, to me, rock and roll was the only, um, besides I guess uh, uh, forms of indie rock or just indie music in general and folk music in general. Um, to me, rock and roll is the most honest um, genre of music out there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's why we, we love doing it. And not to say that a lot of the music, the, the pop and, you know, top 40, whatever you want to call it, music that's on the radio, not that it's absolutely horrible, but for me, you know, and a lot of people ask me, you know, why do you center on, you know, rock or metal and all that? And it's because, to me, like you said, it's one of the last real, completely real areas of music that's left you know he, all these artists on the radio or tv they're like he said they're, they're singing stuff that was most likely in a lot of, for a lot of them written for them or written by somebody else or stuff like that or a lot of them aren't even really singing with their performances anymore and when it comes to rock most of it is is real and genuine and honest and you know, all play, yeah, all playing their own instruments. They they wrote it. You know, you're getting the artist when you listen to it. Yeah, yeah. You know? and it doesn't it doesn't sound as good as uh, putting on a CD. But back uh, you know back in the day, people lived to go to an actual live concert and hear the difference and compare and contrast the actual CD recording versus the live performance and. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, rock isn't as polished as everything else, and I think that's what makes it real and true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so finally, with uh, 2014 surprisingly as unrealistic as it seems, just around the corner, um, it doesn't seem possible to me. But you're, you're got that. Oh, wait, it's just Thanksgiving. We still got a whole month or so. <laughs> No, you want some food again, don't you? Oh, man. I just got, I just got finished eating. I'm probably going to eat again before the night's over. So. <laughs> now, what do, you guys have, what do you guys have planned for next year? A lot of got a lot of shows, maybe some more writing. Uh, what's 2014 look like for Roses on Red? Well, I've got a... Uh, Allison and I have a, a small studio we're building. Um, we're not going to be putting out our own music, but it's really going to be used for... Uh, more ideas, you know, writing and pre-production. Uh, Blake had a small Pro Tools rig for the last album, and we did all of our scratch tracks and pre-production at home, and then brought it to our producer, and then our producer was able to help us refine and arrange a little bit from there. But, you know, doing that gave everybody a good idea of what they're exact, exactly what's going to be played on the album and it gave everybody time to refine their part before they got there and it saved us two or three days in the studio so mm. it, it, it made it a little bit more comfortable for us and and um saved saved our producer a lot of time too because he's a he's a really busy guy he stays booked up throughout the year so um first on the agenda as soon as christmas is over i'm, I'm building a small studio and we're going to start uh, writing for for our next EP or our next album or what have you. <laughs> but uh, we got a we got a show with we in 2013 was so awesome, man. We had the chance to play with some of our favorite bands in the whole world. We got to play with Icon for Hire, Taproot, and I Empire, three of our favorite bands in the whole world. And, I see and you. to me, that is that is so cool. That's that's why I started playing music in the first place. Not only for people to tell me they like what I'm doing, but to be able to play alongside people that I admire and I look up to. Nice. Um, I saw you guys so also played with Pillar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we played with Pillar a couple of years ago. That was a uh, that was at a church over in um, Germantown, Tennessee, nice. and uh, that was an amazing show as well. That was right when uh, Whatever It Takes was their single at the time. Uh, nice. An amazing, amazing show. But uh, hopefully 2014's got a lot more of... We're of, playing with Straight Line Fish in January. Yeah, oh, playing yeah, with Straight yeah. Line Fish January That's 12. Fun, yeah. um, same, the same place we played with Icon for Hire, uh, the Rock House Live guys out in Memphis. They Every time a good... Uh, it seems like every time a good 
uh, rock band with a female in it comes through. They're like, yep, you guys are on it. We're like, all right, cool, man, that'll work. Nice. We, look up, like Paul Gavin, I'm like, yeah. we look up to a lot of those bands. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the singer for Straight Line Stitch, she's actually from Clarksville, which is mm -hmm. um, about two hours away from where we are, and we actually play out Clarksville a lot. So nice. um, that makes for get, hopefully going to make for some interesting conversation when we <laughs> put this jam with. Oh, but uh, sure. we got a, we got a, we're planning a small tour, um, uh, probably around uh, around Texas and Oklahoma. We're going to try to get down to Louisiana. Yeah, we're we're going to start out and hit. Uh, the western side of Arkansas and then Oklahoma and then go down to Texas and then to kind of make a circle from there. Um, you know, we still all work full time, so it's really hard for us. We're not in a position right now where we can just drop everything and go on the road. Hopefully one day that's kind of the, the idea. That's what we all want to do. But right now, you know, this is our first little mini tour that we're going to book and we're all uh, working really hard to to book some venues out out in Texas right now in Oklahoma. Nice. Um, so I guess uh, just we're going to be writing. We're gonna we're gonna keep you know hopefully get you know get better at writing and and playing our instruments and uh, you know just make a whole lot of friends in the process and and get people all all across the world excited for what we're doing, man. Because it's so cool when somebody in another country messages you and says you know. I, in, in broken English, they tell you that they really, really appreciate uh, your music, and they. And, and to me, that is the most mm -hmm. just. Um, I, I don't know if humbling is the right word for it, but you can't put it into it's words. So you know? It's uh, yeah. it's so surreal to to have somebody mm -hmm. say, you know, your music mm -hmm. means so much to me, or they ask, they start asking me about my gear and asking me tips on playing guitar and stuff, and yeah, I'm like, yeah. man, I was, I was. I was doing that a few years ago. You know, I was the guy asking, you know, other people that I looked up to about playing guitar and what kind of gear they're using and stuff like that. So I know what it's like to, to be, to discover that new band and find that connection with them. Yeah. And to me, that's really cool that somebody's uh, finding that connection with us. That's, that's the coolest thing in the whole world uh, for me. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a really cool thing. And, uh, man, if you guys ever get up to Indiana... Let me know, because I have to catch you. I may have to come down to Tennessee sometime just to catch you guys live. Um, cause um, well, we got to... Tennis, Tennessee's... There's so much talent in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I can't knock any band around here, man, because we're we're between Memphis and Jackson. And um, and we've got... We play out in Nashville a few times a year, too. Between... Um, West Tennessee and Middle Tennessee and Eastern Arkansas, there's so much talent. And the people here are so spoiled. It's so tough to get a, a, a huge crowd to come out to the show. Because there's so uh, many people. Then, there's so many. There's bands. so much. It's the, the scene down here is oversaturated with just extraordinary talent. I can't knock any of the bands out here that work as hard as we do because, you know, they're just as good as we are, if not better. Um, and, and it's just a musical. The, the Southeast. Is, is so rich in, in musical talent, musical history. Um, the people here are spoiled on it. Wow. So when we go when we go somewhere else, uh, out of state, man, um, we go down to you know Mississippi or uh, Alabama, you know, or, or even the other side of Arkansas, man. People are like, "Rock man, roses on red." Oh my gosh! And the whole town comes out to see it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so is it hard? Yeah, to is it harder to get? Uh, is it harder to get noticed and really, you know, quote unquote, get that break that you need in in Tennessee in the Nashville area just because of how many how many good artists and bands there are there that the the audience is so much you know so spread out or um, how what well there's bands there's bands in Nashville that we're really good friends with and they bring us up to Nashville and we bring them to Jackson. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, Jackson, Tennessee is, that's more or less our hometown. That's, that's where, because our fans are, Jackson's kind of the central city where most of our, our, you know, Tennessee fan base is concentrated. But, you know, uh, bands out in Nashville, if they, if they can pull a hundred people to a show, they, they're like, oh my gosh, this is such a great crowd for Nashville. Whereas in Jackson, um, 
you know, if, we, if, if a good band went out to Jackson and played a show, um, you know, 100 people wouldn't really be that much to ask for. Um, so, you know, Jackson, there's a lot of talent in Jackson, but most of the talent in Jackson is left the area. Okay. Um, like, you know, you got Full Devil Jacket. Um, they had their big run about 10 years ago. And uh, Fuel came out of Brownsville, uh, which is where Allison and I live. And um, they had their, you know, they're still doing their thing, but they were huge um, a few years ago. Um, you know, got Carl Perkins and the whole, the rockabilly scene was started in Jackson, Tennessee. But that's most of of the huge, huge acts that come out of that area have already left. So we're kind of trying to, we're working with the bands around Memphis and Nashville and the surrounding areas to kind of revive the uh, the rock and roll scene out there. Nice. And, uh, we've got a, a really cool rock station out there, um, 102.3 The Rocket, and the guys there really help us out with uh, advertising and promoting, and they really believe in what we're doing. So um, it's a really, really cool city. Um, it's not too big, and it's not too small, and it's, uh, the people there are really receptive to what we're doing, and they're, they're eager to come out and, and check out uh, bands that come into town. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to talk to me. It's It's been great, and again, thank you so much. Um, absolutely, it's, it's been awesome. So. Well, Reggie, we, we, certainly, we, we appreciate you guys so much, man. We appreciate you taking the time out of your night to talk to us, man. And, um, the fact that somebody of, uh, of your caliber um, and, and your professionalism checked out our CD and said, man, I love what you guys are doing, and I, and I can't stop listening to it. And the fact that you listen to it twice in one day after you've already heard it all the way through, man, to me that's cool. Because you've listened, you know, you've interviewed the best of the best, and you've listened to the best of the best, and then you, you rank us up there with them, man. That, to me, that is, um, that's amazing, and I, I very much appreciate you for it. Well, man, you guys deserve it. It, it, it. I can't even say it enough. It is a great record. And um, if anybody out there has not heard it, you're you're robbing yourself of a great experience. Check, pick up the <laughs> album, pick it up and listen to it. It is outstanding, guys. Thank you so much thank for tonight. You. Thank, thank you, again, Reggie. We'll stay in contact, man. And uh, if we ever, yeah, if we have, yeah, man. We'll love to talk to you again in a few months and just kind of see where both of us are at. Yeah. Uh, if you ever get down to Tennessee or um, around this area, give us a call and. Uh, if we ever get up to Wards, Indiana, man, we'll uh, we'll definitely hit you up, and we'll have to um, we'll have to go, you know, eat y'all have to eat or something before the show yeah. if we get up that way soon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely keep like yeah, same to you. Keep in touch with me, and uh, we'll be making some stuff happen next year. So sounds great, man. Awesome, guys. Have a great night. Have a great holiday. Thanks. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And uh, happy Thanksgiving. And happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna let him that one, man. <laughs> All right, Reggie. Thanks again, man. All right, man. Merry Thank you. You too. Keep in touch. We'll see ya. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.